we are in our right minds. We acknowledge God for the fact that we could walk from the parking structure or the parking area to this place without any assistance, assistance from anyone. So I thank God for his ongoing goodness in my life. And I thank him for you and for your presence there tonight. Is there anyone with us who's not a Seventh-day Adventist? Would you give us your name, please? Rowan. Rowan? Hello, Rowan. Where are you from? I'm from the Philippines. Philippines. I like the Philippines very much. Who invited you, Rowan? Uh, brother uh, Roman. Brother Roman. All right. Roman and Rowan. Sounds like a good pair. Okay. <laughs> nice to see you, Rowan. God bless you. God bless you. Did I see your hand, my sister? Mary, Mary P. Mary P. Yes. And where are you from? Good. And who invited you? The same busy brother Rowan. Okay. Thank you for coming, the both of you. And may the Lord bless you. We are honored by your presence. Thank you very much. <coughs> Hi, how are you? Come on in, come on in. Anyone else with us who is not a Seventh day Adventist? Ah. What's your name? Max. That's it. All right, and who invited you? Uh, yeah. Brother Kerr. Brother, okay, all right. The Kerr is a good man. Thank you for coming. And may God bless you in every possible way. And God blesses people. He loves to do that. You know, the Bible says, He maketh his son to rise on whom? Just and unjust. Yeah, just and unjust. God is, He loves to bless everyone. Sendeth rain, you know, on the evil and the good. Okay. When do I finish? 8 o'clock. And then 830 question and answer. Okay. If you don't need this as a Bible, can you turn it off, please? Let me set the example by turning mine off. Yeah, you go out to it. That little white thing, I do that. Okay, and it's dead. Alright. <coughs> Follow my example, please. All phones turned off if you don't need them as a Bible. Let me ask you this, uh, because I ask you all the time to turn off phones. You tell me, if you're walking to this building with this, and someone sees it, tell me what assumptions may go through the person's mind. <laughs> that you're what? A godly person. You're what? A godly person. Yes, you're a godly person. The person may be wrong, but it's a reasonable assumption. <laughs> Are you with me? All right. What else might the person assume? You're on your way to church. Or from church. Mm. When they see you with this, do they see you on your way to church? <laughs> Not really, no. So all I'm saying is, when you carry one of these, this is a visual representation or visual symbol or a non-auditory witness for God. Because the person may say, can I come? Can I come? When they see you walking like this, they may wonder, who is he texting? And that's it. Well, how can I steal that phone? Possibly. Okay. All right. Favor number two. While I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That's based on Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. And favor number three, what's that? I want you to think. Isaiah 118, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. God is a God who reasons. And it's an amazing thing that God will reason with us. And finally we see that he's right. But he's willing to reason with us. All right, let's bow our heads and pray. Our loving Father in heaven, we ask you in the name of Jesus to receive us. We come seeking a blessing. We come seeking understanding of your will for our lives. As we bow in your presence, dear God, forgive our sins. Remove from us all that is unlike you. Grant to us now the Spirit. Jesus said in John 16, 13, How be it, when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. Father in heaven, grant us the gift of your Spirit, that he may guide our minds into truth. Work through me, dear God. As I humble myself before you, use me as an unresisting instrument. At the end of this meeting, let us know that we have been blessed. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say, Amen, Amen. and Amen. Again.
Again, this is a youth meeting. <coughs> Am I right, Brother Kiran, with Emmanuel Ora? So the emphasis is youth, but youth suggests various age levels and limits. All right, I want you to uh, go with me to Psalm 19. Let's read verse 1. You actually know it without having to look. Psalm 19, verse 1. Well, let's say, the heavens declare what? The glory of God and the firmament sheweth his handiwork. All right. We'll reread that, and this time microscopically. The heavens declare, or show, or proclaim, or make public, or announce, or reveal. The heavens declare what? The glory of God. One question that arises is, what is the glory of God? The second half of the verse says, and the firmament sheweth his what? Handiwork. Now the heavens firmament essentially the same thing. What do we understand by the glory of God? Let's go to Exodus 33. We shall read from verse 18. Exodus 33, reading from verse 18. Exodus is book number two. All right, you found it? Chapter 33, reading from verse 18. And he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Now this is Moses asking God to show him his glory. Now what Moses meant was to see that brilliance of God. God understood that. Listen to what God said. And he said, I will make all my goodness pass before thee. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before thee. And I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will show mercy to whom I will show mercy. Verse 20, and he said, Thou canst not see my face. Why? There shall no man see me and live. So God is God understood Moses wanted to see his face. That's why God said, I cannot show you my face. By the way, many times we ask God for things and God gives us something else. Because God knew if he showed his face to Moses, what would happen? He would die. And so God said, I won't show you my face. I'll show you something you need to see. Now let's see what God showed Moses as we're trying to answer the question, what is God's glory? Let's go to chapter 34. We shall read from verse 5. Exodus 34, verse 5. And the Lord descended in the cloud and did what? Stood with him there. Verse 6. And the Lord did what? Proclaim the name of the Lord, the Lord, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity, transgression, and sin, and that will by no man's clear the guilty. Now, we can stop right there. God shows Moses a glimpse of what? And abundant in goodness and truth, and merciful, and gracious, and forgiving, and long-suffering. What is God showing Moses? His character. The kind of God he is. Not the kind of God, not how he looks, but who he is. And so the Bible says, he that cometh to God must believe that he is. Regardless of how he looks. How he looks is not essential. What he is, is critical to our salvation. And so God showed Moses who he was, the kind of character he had. And so the glory of God is the character of God. There's a book with which you're familiar. It's called God's Amazing Grace. Page 322, paragraph 2, the author says, the glory of God is his character. And this is true. Go to John 17. John 17, we'll read verse 22. Listen to the words of Christ as he prays to his Father. John 17, verse 22. When you found me, say amen. Read with me. And the glory which thou givest me, I have given them. Stop. Christ is not referring to light. He's referring to the character. 
The glory which thou givest me, I have given them. Let's go to John 15. Let's read verse 8. And it says, Herein is my Father glorified that ye bear much fruit. And what are the fruits? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, faith, meekness, temperance. And so when we produce, express, reflect those characteristics, we're glorifying God at the very highest level. The glory of God is His character. Now, listen to Psalm 19 verse 1 again. The heavens declare what? The glory of God. Now, that's the heavens. Let's go to Isaiah 6. Isaiah 6. We read from verse 1. All right. Some of us are still looking. Isaiah 6. It's okay. It's uh, 28 after 7. Do you have it now? In the year, verse 1, read it from verse 1. In the year that King Messiah died, I saw also the Lord, where? Sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train did what? Fill the temple. Keep reading. Above it, stood the seraphim. Each one hath six wings. Keep reading. With twin he covered his feet, and with twin he covered his feet, and with twin he did fly. Now, verse 3 carefully, read on. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is what? Yes, the, the whole earth is what? Full of his glory. Stop. Psalm 91 says what? The heavens declare the glory of God. We've seen the glory of God is his. Come on, don't be so slow. The glory of God is his. Now, Isaiah 6 verse 3 says, The whole earth is what? That's full of his glory. Which means, whether you look up or you look around, there are evidences of the kind of person God is. Don't let I say evidences. I didn't say proof. The Bible is not a book of proof. Where there's proof, there's no need for faith. Am I talking to myself? Yeah. Are you following? Yes. Where there is proof, there is no need for faith. But where there's evidence, then you follow the evidence as it leads. If you're honest and you're reasonable, evidence is a path you follow. And so the Bible says, all above us is evidence of the kind of God, God is, his character. All around us, the earth is full of his glory. So that by studying the heavens, and the earth, we can come into contact at some level with the kind of God the Creator is. Now, why did I give that introduction? You told me last night some of you are studying. Or you have studied. Maybe you're teaching. Young people, listen to me carefully. You spend more time in school than you do in church. Is my statistic correct? Yes. All right, let's see it again. How many hours a day do you have in school day? How many? No, no. In school. In school. Eight. How many days in a week? That's 40 hours in school in a week. Plus the hours studying and doing your homework. It could be 80. Now, in the classroom, outside of the classroom, but connected to the classroom. How many hours do you spend in church? On Sabbath, how many? Okay, six. For those of you who are really extreme, six. All right, six. How many on Monday? No, I mean an average week. How many on Monday? How many on Sunday? Tuesday. Come on, don't be ashamed. God is listening. How many on Wednesday? One. You said it was such pride. One. Okay, how many on Thursday? Friday. One. So one on Friday, one on Wednesday, that's two. Six on Sabbath, eight in a week, and there are 162 hours in a week. Now, but you spent 40 in school. Then, if you're a child of God, I want you to understand tonight that school is an excellent place to learn about God. 
You say, how? I say, in chemistry. I say, in astronomy, not astrology. In astronomy. I say, in math. I say, in architecture. In any subject you study, you should look for the fingerprint of God. Why? Because the heavens declare the glory of God, and the earth is full of His glory. You see, it changes the way you study. Now you're not studying for a grade. Is that what you call it in Qatar? A grade? Yes. What do you call it? A grade. A grade. Okay. You are studying to discover God. It removes the pain of study. Are you with me? Yes. It's no longer self-focused. I want this grade so I can get this job, so I can get this salary, and get a house and a wife and 2.5 children. <laughs> Statistically speaking, you are searching for God. You are in a field of the evidence of the presence of God. And you're looking, and as you discover some evidence of God, your experience with God deepens, and the knowledge becomes more meaningful. So that study becomes a search for God, not a pursuit of a grave, but the graves will come. Are you with me? As Jesus said, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all this they will come. One makes the other inevitable. What does inevitable mean? What's that? Can't avoid it. It has to happen. Let's say you're studying, I don't know, anatomy. Look for God. Is God a designer, yes or no? Yes. yes. This is the Psalm 91. The heavens declare the glory of God. The firmament showed his handiwork. There's another more powerful verse that makes that clear. Go to Romans 1, let's read verse 20. Romans 1, verse 20. I want you to understand that a student is in the presence of God more than anybody else, virtually. Because any subject you study brings you into contact with God if you're looking. Romans 1, verse 20, do we have that? Yeah. Read with me. For the invisible things of Him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Stop. The Bible says the evidence for God is so overwhelming in nature that no one can produce the excuse. I never knew God. You may not have known the word G-O-D, but by just being on this earth, you had to conclude there is a power beyond me. For the invisible things of him, what are the invisible things? Characteristics. From the creation of the world are clearly seen. One of the clearest things the creation teaches us, God is a God of law. Are you following me? He is a God of law. Everything functions by law. You name something that does not function by law other than sin, and I'll be very surprised. Everything functions by law. The universe is made up of what? Give me one word. Physicists? Matter. Matter. And matter generally is broken down into what? Three states. What are they? Solid, liquid, and gas. Now you answer me. Do solids behave a certain way, yes or no? Yes. Yes is weak. Do they behave a certain way? Yes. Do they follow laws? Yes. Do, do liquids follow laws? Yes. Do gases follow laws? Yes. When you heat a gas, what does it do? It expands. Just a law. There's a law which says a gas occupies the entire shape of the container in which it is poured. A, a, a solid doesn't do that. A solid does not do that. A liquid does it partially. A gas does it completely. Laws. As far as the experts know, in every atom, what's in the nucleus? Protons and there are no electrons in the nucleus. 
And the proton has what charge? Positive and the neutron what charge? Negative. <coughs> and where's the electron found? Outside. Yes. In every atom. That's a law. <coughs> you know why birds can fly and some pl planes can fly? One of the reasons is based on a principle called Anuni's principle. It says that the pressure under an airfoil passing through liquid is greater than the pressure above. And it pushes the thing up. Those of you who are just gloriously confused, let me say it again. <laughs> an airfoil is something that passes through. A liquid is water or air. Air is a liquid. Air is a, it, uh, yes. And air or, or water, it passes through. As it passes, the pressure under is greater than the pressure above. And that greater pressure pushes the thing up. That's one reason why planes can stay up. And a wing of a plane is designed to maximize that principle. So the air goes over. That's why in the winter, the wing of a plane has to be what? De-iced. So it does not disturb the architecture of the wing that allows the wind, the, the, the wind to flow in a certain way that the pressure under is greater and keeps the wing up. That's a law. We learn from nature that God is a God of law. He's a God of design. So one of the first things I wish to place in your mind, those of you in school, students, young people, in school, plan to go to school or go back to school, studying is an excellent way to get to know God. I may actively ask, Father, where is evidence of your activity in this subject matter? Because God has given you a promise. Let's read the promise. Jeremiah 29, verse 13. Let's read the promise. What I want to say was air and, and uh, water are fluids. That's what I wanted to say. The word fluid would be happening. Not that air is a liquid, air is a fluid. All right. Jeremiah 29. What verse did I say? 13. When God say amen. amen. Read with me. And you shall. Then you shall what? Seek me, go on, and find me, go on, when you shall search for me, how? With all your heart. What I'm saying to you, seek God in the classroom. How do you study biology and not see evidence of God? How do you observe the regularity of the rise and set of the sun and not come to some conclusion that this is deliberately designed to function this way? So the Bible says, if you seek me, you'll find me. It does not restrict the seeking to Bible study. It just says seek. Now, point number two, students. Let's go to Daniel. We'll go to chapter 8. And this point, if you're not impressed with point 1, this second point will put joy in your hearts. Daniel 8. We read 15 and 16 of Daniel 8. And when you understand these two verses in the context of my remark, your love for God should increase. Daniel 8, 15 and 16. Are you with me? Read with me. And it came to pass when I had seen what the vision and sought for the wall. Then behold, they stood before me as the appearance of a man. Verse 16, and I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which cried at the hall and said, What? Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. Stop. Now, let's look at it microscopically. Let's go to verse 15 again. Read now, carefully. Read. No, 15. And it came to pass, uh huh. After when I had seen the vision and what? Stop. What do you understand by sought for the meaning? He's trying to understand. What does this mean? You're trying to understand Pythagoras' theorem. You're trying to understand Newton's three laws of motion. He sought for the meaning. What do you employ in that kind of search? Your brain. Listen again. He sought. He tried. 
Then behold, this stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Ulai, which called and said, or cried and said, What? Gabriel. 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 Who's Gabriel? Gabriel? Not just any angel. Gabriel. Let's show some respect for Gabriel. He is the highest angel in heaven. The most powerful. In other words, in heaven is God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, Gabriel. That position used to be occupied by whom? Who's now Satan? Mm -hmm. Now, listen to the voice. Gabriel, come on, finish it. Leave this man. What? Stop. Why did God say that? You see, if Gabriel is the highest angel, that voice, the voice of God. Okay, why did God say that? He was seeking and he had reached what? The limits of his ability. When you do that, mm -hmm. God steps in. And where you come to the end of your rope, a divine rope is extended to you. Mm -hmm. And God did not suggest to Gabriel. He said what? Make him understand. Now, which means there's a principle in the Bible. Human beings can look forward to instructional assistance from divine beings. When they have applied their minds first and sought for the meaning, which means heaven does not help lazy people. Amen. All lazy people say amen. 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 No, 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 no. Don't say amen. I expected the place to be quiet. Don't say amen. You're not lazy. Repent, repent, repent. Okay. Heaven helps the person who tries so hard. His very best. That's a beautiful verse. Gabriel, make him understand. Amen. That applies not only to prophecy, it applies to physics. It must apply to chemistry, biology. Someone said he's studying Arabic. Any subject matter. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. With knowledge and wisdom. For this is for tonight, knowledge. Make him understand. Because as you understand, your understanding of God increases. Your view of God is clarified. My young friends, God is waiting to assist you in your studies. But you must first seek for the understanding. Now, let's go to Daniel chapter 9, the very next verse. Well, before that, let's look at verse 19 of Daniel 8. Verse 19 of Daniel 8, read with me, and he says, Behold, I will, what? I will make thee know. What shall be the last end of the indignation? Yes, I will make you know. Because the angel was under command. Make him understand. He said, I will make you know. Now go to chapter 9. <coughs> Let's read from verse 21. Yeah, yeah wise I was yet speaking in prayer. prayer. One. Even the man Gabriel, whom I had seen, in the vision at the beginning, being made to fly swiftly, come on, touch me about the time of the evening oblation. Keep reading. And he informed me and talked with me and said what? Go oh, Daniel, go on. I have come forth to what? Give thee what? Skill and understanding. Stop. Oh, what a beautiful promise. I have been sent to give you <coughs> skill and understanding so that you can understand this prophecy, or in your case, physics, chemistry, pharmacology, archaeology, whatever. I have come. My friends, angels are ready to come to your side and assist you in your studies. But, what condition must be present? You have done all you can. Mm -hmm. All you can. And heaven will assist you. 
I have come to give you skill and understanding. Now you may say, well, that's just for prophecy, not just for prophecy. Go to Daniel 1. <coughs> Daniel 1. These men, let's read verse uh, 4. <coughs> Children, what? <coughs> no blemish, but well favored and skillful in all, wisdom and cunning in, <coughs> and understanding science, and such as had ability of them to stand in the king's palace, and whom they might teach them, and tongue of the Chaldeans. Now, let's read verse 5. And the king appointed them a daily provision of the king's meat, and of the wine which he drank, so nourishing them three years, and at the end thereof they might stand before the king. Now they were on a three-year study program. A specific curriculum, a specific diet. You know they had problems with the diet. Curriculum, okay, we can handle it, not the diet. Now, let's go to verse 17. What does it say? As for these four children, now read carefully. What's the next word? God stop. What's the next word? Gave them what? Knowledge and skill in. He stop in what? All learning, meaning all that they were assigned to do. God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. Which means it wasn't just prophecy. Nebuchadnezzar had no interest in Hebrew prophecy. He wants them to be good administrators in Babylon. So the curriculum had to be a Babylonian curriculum. Oh, thank you, Professor. God bless you. So God gave them, I want you to notice the wording, learning and skill. Knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. Again, the Bible tells us, God will step in and bless the minds of his people. Now, let's go to verse 19. What does it say? And the king communed. They're being tested. Keep reading. And, 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 and in what? All unto Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Verse 20. And in all what? He found them what? Ten times better than all the magicians and astrologers that were in his. They were ten times better. Look at verse 17 again. God gave them knowledge and skill in all learn wisdom, the learning of wisdom. He gave them. But as a reward for what? Their efforts. And they fear for him, of course. You have to use his brain. You see, God gave us a brain to understand divine things. Let me say it again. God is so beautiful, God makes it possible for a <coughs> finite brain to grasp infinite concepts. They don't waste this brain on drugs, on pornography on soccer all day, soap operas. Apply this to these concepts that change the character. You don't need help from God to, to study pornography. You need God from hell to watch Manchester United. You need help from God to study righteousness, holiness, faith. Godliness, forgiveness, the gospel, redemption, growth in Christ. There's a guarantee of divine help. The Bible says, if we search for God, we will find him. Now, this is a research project that requires no funding. Are you with me? Yes. No, you're not with me. You know how many professors try to get funding for their research? Yeah. Can't get it. God offers you a research project. You don't have to fund it. And it is the greatest because what expert would not like to come up with positive proof that I found God? 
Not the God particle, God. And here it is. And students, what am I saying to you? You have an excellent opportunity eight hours a day, five days a week, to conduct a search for God in whatever subject matter lies before you. Because the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, which is the third and final point. How do you use that knowledge? That's wisdom. How do I apply the knowledge you understand? That begins with God. So the acquisition, getting the knowledge, begins with God. The recognition of knowledge comes from God. Using it properly begins with God. As you get it, you see God. Then you use it for His glory. Now this is the context in which you study. Even if you're attending the University of Satan, this is the context in which you study. When you do that, let me say it again. When you do that, meaning God is the focus, not a grade, heaven will assist you and bless you. Now you may say, but well, preacher, can an atheist do well? Yes. Remember, the atheist has just this much to him. You have what? An eternity. All right. Five to eight. Any questions? Yes, give us your name and ask us. Sorry, man, I'm fine. My name is Benjamin. Benjamin, do you know what that name means? Oh, some of the right hand. Some of the right hand, yes. In battle, the Benjamites went in up front. When the Israelites went to war, there was a, a law. They had to go first, the Benjamites. All right. And what king was from Benjamin? Saul. Saul, Saul. yeah, the first king. All right. Yes, but Benjamin. <coughs> Uh, from the book of Isaiah, <coughs> yeah, mm -hmm. chapter 65, mm -hmm. it talks of... Uh, now, is this connected to what I said tonight? Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. I, I have a concern, I want you to clarify. But it says, if it's connected, I, I don't want to take my mind away. I those who did not ask. Isaiah 65? Yeah, first one. Okay, go on. I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. Uh -huh. I was found by those who did not see Isaiah 65? Oh, 65. Yes. Oh, I thought you had a next chapter of 6 verse 5. Sorry. Okay, all right. Okay, go ahead. Go ahead, Michael. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. All right, all right. Go ahead. Yeah. So it's talking. Read it again. Read it again. All right. It says, I revealed myself to those who did not ask for me. Mm -hmm. I was found for those, uh, by those who did not seek me. Mm -hmm. I want that clarification. Now, that all right. contradict what you have understood. Uh, good question. We have to seek. Good question. Good question. All right. Okay. When Adam sinned, <coughs> there was a division between God and man, a separation immediately. Who came down into the garden? Well, no, no, no. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Thank you for that question. Romans 3. We read from verse 10 of Romans 3. What was his question? He said, Isaiah 65 says, I reveal myself to those who do not seek me. All right, does that contradict what I will say? Romans 3. Let's read from verse 10. What does it say? As it is written, there is none righteous, no one who Go on. There is none that understandeth. Go on. There is none that seeketh after God. Stop. What the Bible is saying, in our fallen condition, we cannot take the first step to go looking for God. Listen to Jesus Christ as he speaks to Zacchaeus. Luke 19, verse 10. The Son of Man is come to what? To seek and to save. Now, why seek and save? Now, keep this in mind. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3, reading from verse 9, as we try to answer that very, very interesting question. Genesis 3, verse 9. Have you found it? Are you still looking? And the Lord God did what? Paul unto Adam and said unto him, Where art thou? So, what is God doing? Seeking. Why? Where was Adam? You see, because of sin, our natural mindset is to avoid God. Then to induce us to reverse our direction, God has to give us, you know, you dangle a carrot in front of a horse and it moves. So in that sense, 
Before Adam could see God, God revealed himself to someone who wasn't seeking him. Because that first step has to be made or no one can be saved. And it's an act of grace that God has to move first. Because the sinner cannot seek for God. So yes, I reveal myself to people who never sought me. If he doesn't do that, no one can be saved. But when God has made that first step, now it says God, you take over. <laughs> Let me say it again. If God doesn't seek you first, you will never find God. That's grace. So Christ came to this earth. We didn't go up to heaven to fix the problem. Heaven came down. Amen. Because the carnal nature cannot see God. Is that clear? Yes. It doesn't want God. There's none that understand it. There's none that see it after God. They just don't understand it. That's why spiritual things are foolishness. They are converted. All right. Thank you. But they're going to go this. Somebody else? An easier question than that. 